Hello, hello everyone. <laughs> hello. Welcome to Micro Twitter Journal Club. Yeah. Um, uh, Journal Club run by me, Danny. Uh, I am, uh, and my partner, Faz. Uh, I'm, uh, I studied microbiology in graduate school, uh, staff aureus actually, and now I fact check pharmaceutical ads for a living. <clears throat> And I studied Streptococcus pyogenes, uh, making the flesh eating bio bacteria go in the dark. Uh, and now, well, and I've worked in research integrity, and now I just work in journal publishing. Just made them glow in the dark. That was the point. Uh, well, and also worked <laughs> on a vaccine for them. But, you know. <laughs> oh yeah, Minor but the point. fun Minor part was point. making them glow in the dark. <laughs> Um, yeah, and we're uh, coming together in this time to talk about journal articles. Um, we used to do a journal club when we were in grad school called the Twitter Journal Club, where people discussed on Twitter, but... Oh. Oh. Uh, he he seems to have freeze there. Yeah, he seemed to have freeze for a second there. But, um, yeah, right mid slow. I, <laughs> uh, I was just saying that we, we used to do a Twitter Journal Club where we, uh, discuss papers on Twitter, but 140 characters is pretty restrictive. We've yeah. moved on to talking in video, um, but we still want to engage with uh, the audience and the listeners. If you guys have questions, um, yep. please tweet us out using the hashtag micro Twitter, micro TWJC. Yep. <clears throat> oh, it's up in the corner. <laughs> yep, it's, up, it's, it's, it's right above you, and it's like up in the corner for me. And our Twitter <laughs> handles are down below, so follow us if you want yep. to keep, keep track of the conversation. Um, yeah. And so, so this... today, oh yeah, go ahead. <laughs> oh yeah, this week we've been looking at at this paper called "The Selection of Viral v Viral Variants During Persistent Infection of Insectivorous Bat Cells with M Middle East Respiratory Corona uh, Middle Re Middle East Re <laughs> Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus." Yes, oh, MERS. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I mean, as most people probably know, like. Uh, emerging coronaviruses is not new in the history of our <laughs> of our society. Um, we had uh, classic SARS <laughs> beforehand, yep. um, and after that there was MERS. Uh, of course, those outbreaks didn't uh, weren't as wide reaching <laughs> as the one that we're currently experiencing. Um, but you know, there's a lot of scientific information that was uh, being produced uh, after these outbreaks, and the one that we're looking at today is um, sort of a very interesting experimental approach i would say it's uh it's looking at um uh cell the passaging these viruses uh long term long term <laughs> in cell culture um and looking at the variants that arise so evolution experimental evolution yeah. <laughs> Weird. And what happened after that was, uh, I've got a second video that I'm going to show. About that change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, they, they infected with a very low amount of virus, right? The MOI, or the multiplicity of infection, <laughs> yeah. um, was like, you know, a fraction of what would kill the cells. They use this term TCID. I yes. think it's like the tissue culture death percentage. Yes. <laughs> um, and so they use like a fraction of the amount of virus that would kill the cells. And of course, cells still die, right, in that yeah. circumstance. Um, but but I guess by, by giving so little, they have a greater chance of establishing, um, yeah, this... This persistent infection. Uh, yeah, uh, Danny seems to have frozen a little bit again, but that's... <laughs> oh no, oh, no <laughs> my connection's not good today. But yeah, the, and I think almost like trying to repli re re replicate the physiological situation because in real life you wouldn't get like a massive amount of coronavirus. It'd start off like very small and then like propagate. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, with with tissue culture cells, you're always dealing with a very unique model system. That doesn't that you get some information that's rel related to what happens in reality, but it's uh, yeah, you, 
it's it's one minute. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, are you okay, Danny? Uh, are you... I I'm fine. I can okay. hear you perfectly. Actually, I think it's just me sending out. Maybe isn't yeah, very good. This is suddenly <laughs> I had this like beeping sound. And boop, and I was like, oh god, what's ha what else could happen to America now? Um, <laughs> Skype is shut down. Yeah. No more communication like, from yeah, the US. June is time for another disaster. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, yeah, I, I think the low MOI is also so they basically maybe get only a few. That's also something that's very helpful in this experimental setup. Like, you don't want to have one cell get infected by a whole bunch of different viruses. Yes. You'd like to see just like one get in there. So if it has a mutation that gives it a certain uh, different uh, adaptation. Yeah. So it basically allows it to... It's not competing against everything else. Yeah, exactly. Are we really struggling with the audio? <laughs> yeah, we, we, we are a little bit. Uh, um, <laughs> okay, let's see. Maybe I have some things open I can close. <clears throat> yeah. I'm... Close my Chromium. That might help. <clears throat> yeah, I'm just going to... Uh, now I've just basically got OBS and Skype open. Uh, so, so just to make make sure. So, yeah, I mean, hopefully the technical issues now this time are going to be less than the last few ones. But, um, yeah, uh, just means maybe I have to upgrade my computer. <laughs> yeah. Um, um. Yeah. So uh, maybe maybe we are some. Uh, or so SARS has already happened, right, in the history of the world. Um, MERS has already happened in the history of the world. We know that it comes from other animals, right? And that's due to people who do um, surveillance in, in those countries, right? Uh, techniques that's used. To, so going, going in, collecting bats, swabbing their buttholes, and yeah. uh, looking, for, <laughs> <laughs> looking for virus. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so we know that it does come from bats and MERS also, we even think, I think people say that it went into camels before it p finally passed into humans, dromedaries. I mean, it's, really, um, yeah, cause coronaviruses, they seem to hit loads of different species and they all seem, and tracking them down to their original one, because for ages they thought SARS came from palm civets or from other things, but it turns out they just like all come from back to bats basically. Yeah, 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 and the, and the civets could be like an intermediate host, and you know, it... yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, system, right? Like little things are different between all these different animals. Um, yeah, and the viruses have to be able to adapt to that. So this paper is basically trying to set up an experimental design where they can pinpoint those changes, um, and maybe that. observation techniques that we could use or yeah things like that <laughs> all right uh yeah shall we get into it the the figures and everything? yeah okay all right so like say fi yeah figure one they they basically describe their pathogenic strategy their experimental design. yeah so mm -hmm. they, mm -hmm. so they've got like their their big brown back back to me cells and kind of describing how they infect them with the virus and then they use immunofluorescence to detect uh, mers cov -E. And so they did look at the TCID of the... Yeah, also uh, in situ hybridization. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, We're using both. I mean, you know, it's good, good techniques, right? Like, uh, this is sort of when we talk about the antibody testing versus the PCR testing. They're, they're using both ways of getting at whether virus is in there. Um, protein and RSL RNA. Yeah, you can see them using um, multiple lines of evidence, which is really good. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. like, I mean, so, so for the first. I'm curious one, about the kit. I didn't read into this too much, but yeah. it's interesting to use kidney cells. I guess that's just convenient. <laughs> yeah. Like they have kidney cells around. Um, that's like a cell line that's established maybe for bats. I, uh, I, I, yeah, I guess that they established it in a previous paper. They fused it with a, a, a virus to make it like tumorigenic, I guess, so that it would keep growing in like uh, a pet petri dish, but. Um, but yeah, I'm, it's not it's not especially clear why they chose the big brown bat as their host because uh, 
the big brown bat is is based in North America and Eurasia. It hasn't generally been associated with big coronavirus outbreaks, but I mean there have been other papers that that have used like m many different uh, bat cells. But I mean, so yeah, I'm not sure why. That I guess for convenience sakes, maybe. Yeah, oh. definitely convenience. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it sounds like. <laughs> Okay. Um, and then in figure B, they're looking at oh how how they slowly stabilize um, the yeah. dosage, right? Oh. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, they how because like because I, I guess the first few days you see almost like cycles of like massive infection and a massive drop. So it's Die almost out. like that's when the yeah when the cells are dying off, and then suddenly you've got the, when the persistent cells like kind of establish their population, then it starts st stabilizing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we'll come to this point probably all the way through this paper, but, you know, this is the fun thing about, or I've always found this really fascinating about pathogenesis, right, is that you don't necessarily want to set out and kill everything if, you're, if your point is just to create a lot of copies of yourself, yeah. right? There's this sort of stable middle line where you just, uh, you, you kill off enough, but you're mostly tolerated, and then you can still just burst every once in a while you're the cells and spread yeah. new virus out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good parasite yeah. never kills up its host fully. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> it keeps you somewhat alive. Um, yeah. <laughs> I guess it sounds very sinister in that sense, but you know, they this is this is a this is um just an ecological rule, right? This is yeah. just like people talk about. Um, I really love this. It's the what the Locke Volterra model of predator prey interactions, yes. right? The the, the wolves eating the rabbits and like yes. if you eat all the rabbits then they collapse and then there's more wolves and then the wolves die off and then the rats come back or the, the, the rabbits yeah. come back and it sort of equalizes out so yeah. we're seeing that they're replicating that dynamic with cells in a dish <laughs> yeah it's so weird they taught, uh, taught me that in microbiology school as well <laughs> like, oh yeah here's some stuff about rabbits and wolves and i'm like oh, i don't know how this re relevant to me and i'm like oh yeah that's how it's relevant <laughs> yeah because of math, math, yeah. and and that like the same patterns. I guess it's also the human thing, right? Like we're always seeing patterns in everything. Yeah. Math is like is the the instantiation of our pattern matching abilities. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, yeah, so here we see the images that they actually get from doing the immunofluorescence with the antibodies or the in situ hybridization with a piece of RNA, um, and they show us that yes, these cells they get infected. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I mean, that's <clears throat> quite important to establish, because if they didn't, then that'd be really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. <clears throat> uh, and that they can see that when they do their dose changes, right, that they are also controlling the amount of cells that get infected. I think that's yeah. also something. Oh, right. And they can even see that in some of the cells, it doesn't replicate that much, right? That Like, you yeah. see, like, a gradient. Some cells are, like, super high in signal, and some sig cells are lower in signal. Yeah, that's and that kind of shows the diversity of, of things that are going on because one infection, there's loads of things going on in it. So that's kind of fascinating. I mean, they also did some uh, electron micrography in their supplemental where where they like showed that oh it was in the endoplasmic reticulum of the cells, which is yeah kind of so got some neat like little fo photos of that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this I mean it's always hard to pick. I mean luckily they have big red arrows pointing like oh here's the virus and that's like, yeah <laughs> good. I yeah because there's just they're like dark little splotches, right? Like if you're yeah. not, if you if you don't look at these images on a regular basis, it's really hard to determine what's going on. Yeah. Um, like mean, in immunofluorescence and in, in situ, like they're using a color, right? And you know, yeah. like the color appears when it binds something, but in electron microscopy, it's just electron density, like things yeah. that are yeah. denser to the beam. And so like, you actually have to know the shapes and things, right? Like to me, to me, I look at this, I'm like, I don't really understand that this is endoplasmic reticulum. Yeah. Uh, and trying or to like that location of this density. Yeah. Yeah. And looking at the things and like, oh, the the crown shape, that's why it's called coronavirus. Uh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. That's what we would see. I don't really see it clearly in these images, but no. maybe if they blew up a little, you get to see that. And that's, that's what they ultimately made the decision on, right? Like, cause those, shapes don't appear regularly in cells <laughs> yeah so someone looks at it like that doesn't look right yeah so i'm glad they showed me some of these images it's nice a little supplement definitely yeah. a supplemental figure oh yeah i 
I oh, I, lo I, oh, I always like looking into supplemental figures. I think you always find some interesting information from them. Yeah, absolutely. And you see the real breadth of the work that's being done in the lab, you yeah. know, like um, that they just don't stop at one thing. <clears throat> yeah. Um, okay, so after they... Oh. oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, D does basically the same sort of... Yeah, they yeah they basically like look at different expression of different things. Uh, yeah, and basically all these images basically say almost the same thing. And they, yeah. yeah. Yes, so D is the antibody that they use yes. against the virus. So so that's seeing like the viral proteins um, getting expressed on the surface of these cells. Or actually sometimes they also even see it in the endoplasmic reticulum too, right? They, uh, in the persistent infection, you can zoom in. It's like not on the outside of the cells. You can see it just like inside the cytoplasm somewhere. Yeah. That's probably and roughly it's... correlated to ER. And it's interesting because obviously the first thing you think of when you see a persistent cell is like, oh, they just killed all the virus. But it's, good, it's mm. important to establish that, oh, yeah, they definitely have the virus. And Yes. Well, yeah, I guess the virus meaning they have this protein, right? Yes. The, N, <laughs> the, N, the nucleocapsid protein. And then the E figure is going to tell us that they actually have the genome, right? The, the yeah. RNA genome or the transcripts being made from that. What do they actually use to do? Do they say what the... The probe is that they use detect uh, just could be so, yeah uh, so uh, in situ hybrid hybridization so I imagine that they use an RNA probe of some sort um, yeah I was just wondering if I could see quickly let's see yeah I'm watching people reading papers in real time on YouTube <laughs> pure <laughs> entertainment <laughs> Uh, immunoblot, sample buffer, gap pH. Okay, maybe we're not going to find out so easily. I'm going to say a wizard it. did it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's just, you know, they, they talk about, in the later ones, they talk about the primers that they use. You yeah. know, they're using some piece of RNA that's going to hybridize with a specific gene. Um, when they were looking at genomic, or not, yeah, I guess genomic, genomic RNA, they use envelope protein. Hmm. Um, to do the, the RT-PCRs. Um, here, I'm not sure what they're using, but presumably something that's well conserved. Otherwise, they would see it disappear. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, the next figure is loads of graphs. Um, mm. uh, <clears throat> uh, they, so this is where they took a look at the, uh, gene expression of, of MERS-CoV. So I think this was... Yep. So now that they've, they've shown us the, the experimental setup, right? Like we see that they can establish a uh, persistent infection. It lasts for how many days? Uh, 126 days. Passage 15. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and so they're going to talk about just the initial 48 hours, I guess, of this moment in the infection. And they're going to do RT-PCR uh, to look at yeah, all the different genes. Yeah. And well, most of the graphs look pretty much the same. The big one that the, there's some difference in is the or or ORF five gene. Mm -hmm. um, so where that where that seems to be quite down down regulated compared to all the others. So uh, yes, yeah, in persistent infection. Oh, but even in um, yeah, because just from even from day one, I guess right. I think that's yeah. the biggest thing. In day yeah. one, it's totally down regulated. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> uh, yes. Almost immediately. That's uh, quite interesting. Um, mm -hmm. So almost. <clears throat> so they basically took this as meaning that there might be something like this mutant. Has, they called it ORF five. Uh, has something interesting going on with it. Yeah. So ORFs are open reading frame. Basically, <laughs> it makes a protein. Right. This DNA sequence makes a protein, or um, has all of the markers of making a protein of some sort. There's just so many things in a cell, you know, that you get to naming all of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, I mean, even even viruses, right, that only have um, maybe 20, I think coronaviruses, it doesn't have that much going on in its genome. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I guess eight. It has eight things going on, <laughs> plus the structural objects, but... Um, it's like a lot to study. It's it's a lot to be able to name a protein and say like this is a enzyme that does this. Like 
before you know any of that, you know it is a piece of DNA that makes a protein. Yeah. Um, and you don't know what so that yeah, protein this... does, so you might have to be quite careful. What, what you... Because I remember, like, there's a story about just another kinase, where, like, there's... Oh, of... J Jack. Jack. And they had to <laughs> yeah. go back and think of another name for it, because it was really important. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and so they call them ORFs until they maybe know some more biochemical information about them, or they're more well-characterized. Yeah. Um, and probably they'll last... I, I feel like in in this field, they'll probably have these names for a long time, right? Not enough people are going to focus their efforts on these. And um, but, who, but who knows? Once these designations go in and you add a name, it suddenly makes everyone really confused because then they're like, wait, I was working on this protein. What's all... You, I was working on all five. What's this new protein? Oh, and they're the same oh, yeah. one thing. And I've, ha I've had that in things in my field where there's one protein that has like three different names and everyone gets confused about it constantly. Yeah, so, so it does happen, right? Yeah. Eventually people do get around to naming these things and it just causes a headache. But I mean, <laughs> um, those those names are helpful too, right? They, you know, they also yeah. they bring something to the table. Yeah, I was thinking, I think it happens in immunology a lot, right? They have all the cluster of differentiation, CD, yes. one through however many. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was just like, these made the cells different, but they had no idea what they were. They're just like differences between the cells and then they get characterized. <laughs> Um, but there, but it is known. What it was known in the literature before is that um, these ORFs, they are they're considered accessory proteins, right? Like you can remove them from the virus, and the virus can still sort of build itself. Um, they're not like absolutely necessary for infection. Um, and the hypothesis out there, which is supported by some data, is that these accessory proteins. Um, modulate the immune system in some way, right? Because, you know, the virus is getting right into a cell. It's, it's coming into contact with tons of different cellular sensors. It needs some amount of way, uh, some amount of proteins and mechanisms uh, to navigate that landscape of detectors and aggressors, I guess. Um, and people think, hypothesize that these open reading frames, these accessory reading frames are, um, are that's what they do. Somehow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and I think we'll probably see something like that happening with this uh, as well. Um, so, what we, so, there's, uh, so I'm currently showing figure 3A, but figure 3B was uh, uh, basically looking at ex UPE gene as like a consistently expressed like cor coronavirus gene. And yes, they, that's, it's, it's envelope. That's the envelope. envelope. Right, yeah. So that's like it's a small protein. It sits inside the membrane. I mean, you know, I feel like hopefully we're all familiar at this point, right? Coronaviruses, enveloped virus. They have a membrane around them. That's why soap works. Yep. <laughs> um, wash your hands, yeah. people. <laughs> wash your hands. You, cannot, you can't say it enough. Yep. Um, yeah, this protein embeds in that membrane and uh, is, uh, is involved in sort of um, cl clustering the other proteins on that membrane. Um, also maybe the fact that the membranes have to butt off, you know, like yeah. there's a master membrane and then little like viruses pop off. So it's a very important, uh, protein that, uh, probably won't disappear or change <laughs> in a genome. And that's why they're using it as the readout for genomes, right? Cause we're not going to see envelope disappear all of a sudden. Yeah. It's too important of a protein. Yeah. Otherwise you don't get a virus. <laughs> exactly exactly like repeating in person with no face i mean or head i don't know something is like <laughs> <laughs> oh. um yeah so they're tracking the amount of virus um yeah. using the up e gene yeah. and they have four different columns it's both inside the bat cells that they were passaging them in yeah um but then also in a huge a monkey cell line? Human, human cell human, line. MRC, MRC5. Oh, yeah. Mm. So, and <clears throat> they found that there was a difference, oh, there's a difference in both, but it seems to go in different directions, oddly enough. Uh, like, yeah. The, in, in the, like, human cells, the wild type produces more, and the, in, and the ore produces less, but in the bat cells, it's the other way around, which is uh, mm -hmm. interesting. Uh, I mean, it kind of speaks to how, di how many differences there are on a species level just based on cells that, I mean, Human yeah, the bat cell would look they, different. they didn't even reconstitute the whole organism, and you can still see that like the virus behaves differently in these two cellular environments. Yeah, I mean, imagine the implications um, for vampires. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dracula must be just shitting over the coronavirus outbreak. It's catching, gets them <laughs> coming and going. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, that's that's the solution. We just all convert to vampires, right? <laughs> the, the immune the immune system is totally different when you go to a what what did they say? Blood eaters, blood phages. Yeah, hemophages. Uh, I believe. He, hemophages yeah. lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and they are actually careful too to talk about they they did choose the insectivorous right bat yes. cell line because presumably you, you don't know right even between bats that this could be different and yeah. they really tried to replicate the conditions that they hypothesize MERS emerged right so they use like the cell line that they think that represents that bat best um, I think I just want to I don't know if we mentioned though like we said that through passaging, they saw that this OR5 was less expressed. Um, but what's important, too, is that when they isolate the virus right, coming out from those long passages, it's also missing a chunk of OR5. Yeah. <laughs> um, or the whole the whole thing, maybe, actually. Oh, no, no, a they, huge amount of it. Yeah, they found, like, multiple mutations. Like, some of it was – there's one, like, huge mutation. Another version of it had, like, just a few <clears> point <throat> mutations. But the point is that this mutation kept coming up in this one mm -hmm. gene, which is mm -hmm. in itself quite interesting because it just it, – because if it was just one time, then that'd be like, oh, what a coincidence. But if it's multiple times, then it almost seems that there's a selection pressure there. Right, right. So then they actually make, I think, right, a, an OR5 deletion. Or they use an isolate that has the deletion, yeah. right, that large chunk gone. And they say, well, let's just compare them now, right, between the wild-type virus and this one that we keep seeing. Yeah. How do they behave in these two cell systems? Um, yeah, and they sort of behave in opposite ways between the two animals, uh, bats and humans, cells. Um, yeah. yeah, that's very curious, <laughs> um, and, and speaks to the difference in immune system, right? Like we're not we are not the same as bats in that sense. Yeah, um, and mean, so mm. yeah, even on the cellular level, that's just interesting because I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, figure and, and, four. And, and, Sorry. And this data, no, and this data is is going to um, dovetail, I guess, with what the hypotheses are in the literature really well, right? Like, if people are saying, oh, these are accessory proteins, they help deal with immune systems, right? Well, then this is this is good data that supports that line of reasoning, right? We're saying, oh, yeah, immune systems are different. This is also an immune modulatory protein. When we change it, it's changing the outcome of these infections differently between different species. Um, and, 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 you know, I think the they're, they're really trying to push on this hypothesis of, you know, it's these accessory proteins and the flexibility in the accessory proteins that's helping it jump between species barriers because it can vary them and then have different access, right, to different areas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that in itself is very interesting because, like, you, you can actually <laughs> learn a lot about the immune system by the way that different viruses and bacteria mess with us to try and, try and oh, yeah. change things. So this is yeah. – that's – an so, well, I, mean, I think I think as yeah. we both studied pathogenesis, like the history of understanding the immune system is also understanding how different diseases worked on the immune system. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, I'm trying to think of like real famous ones. I think like Rouse sarcoma virus, right, is like this cancer-inducing virus, and that's how we figured out cancer-inducing genes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> was like looking at an infection of a cancer-inducing virus, and we're like what this virus has a gene that looks so similar to something we have in our bodies and then they're like oh gosh like it has a similar function and you know the double hit theory or whatever right like yeah. if you have all these different genetic mutations and then all of a sudden this other gene comes in cancer um and that was like a huge leap forward in cancer that came from studying a virus <laughs> yeah <clears throat> And yeah, you get all sorts of like cool stuff with like immunotherapy, where pe mm. in the like Victorian period, people infect themselves with like flesh eating disease to cure cancer, and yeah, all sorts of like cool stuff that eventually like came up into big ideas about how the immune system worked. And yeah, it's all, yeah, it's all been interesting. Um, and then I, I guess the yeah. important thing too is that studies like I mean, I guess we get to stand on basic research at this point, right? Mm. Because yeah. Because like going down these paths, asking these questions, we don't know where it's going to lead, right? We may learn something that's just really useful to, for somebody else. Um, yeah. And right now, of course, like the, you know, a lot of the research we're trying to focus on, like how is it going to help us during this global pandemic or whatever? Here we're learning the story of a virus emerging, but like who knows what you'll find along the way? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh... Yeah, so moving to what table one? I guess table one, they're just. Uh, going through the list of the different mutations that they yeah. saw um 
and you can see or five is here they see like a stop code on come and and you can see there's some uh other references other literature in the past right yeah. that is informing the way they think they informing their hypotheses on why they think it's going to go out in a certain way yeah uh which is yeah that's uh pretty interesting uh, <clears throat> And also, like, figure four, yeah, figure four's, like, got... got yeah, let's go so, to figure four. Yeah, so this basically looks at, um, like, again, S comparing human cells and bat cells, looking mm -hmm. at the two different strains of COVID. Uh, yeah. No, sorry, not COVID, MERS. Oh, of I've got MERS. COVID on my brain, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, looking at the infection with these two different strains, the wild type and the, the mutation, and then again in the two cell lines, and now they're looking at uh, IFN beta... IFI6, GDP1, MX1, MDA5, and DPP4. These are host proteins. Yes. Um, these are things that our, our cells are making. Some of them are immune modulators, right? The interferons are immune yeah. modulation. Um, DPP4, that's the that's the receptor for MERS. Yeah, that's the host receptor. Um, that's the host they... receptor. Yeah. <laughs> and, well, the interesting thing with the host receptors, they only looked at that apparently in the... Uh, MERS in the EFK cells, and mm. oddly enough, they found like no difference in this one. I think, or like the yeah, they're... it's it's not very different. They uh, so between yeah, so what are they saying? They're saying between the in the bat cells, between infecting with the wild type virus and the mutant virus, no change in the expression of, um, in the expression of the re the host cell receptor. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I feel like that sounds like it should be paired with something that was known in the literature before, <laughs> or yeah. maybe it's, they're they're also setting up actually for the later figures. Yes. Yeah. So this is what is known as foreshadowing in literature. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. <laughs> yeah, foreshadowing. Even in science, yeah. yeah, even in the science literature, this is the yeah. this is the stormy night. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, right before the murder scene. <laughs> I mean, um, I think. Yeah. But and, oh, and I want to say, like, and in in the in the earlier ones where they're looking at the immune modulators, right, IFN beta, IFN, all these genes, um, they are seeing um, between, so I guess well, there's two sets of differences they see, right? Yes. One is between the wild type in the uh, bats uh, versus the deletion in the bats. That's the blue versus the red column, yep. right? They are seeing differences, which makes yeah. sense, right? Yeah, like, that makes sense. <laughs> this immune modulatory... <laughs> protein is missing or hypothesized immune modulatory protein is missing um and it also <laughs> has an effect on these immune regulated genes yeah um and but when they when they look at that same those same two viruses in the human cells um it's like yeah, it's like very very different it's like they're not even tickling <laughs> yeah they're not they're not producing any response in these human cells um yeah. And so, yeah, not having this OR5, um, yeah, basically says these human cells can't, doesn't mount, don't mount these responses at all. Um, but, oh, but they're not even, it's not even like, but there's not, it's not even a difference between wild type necessarily and um, the OR5. It's just they don't respond yeah. the same way. Yeah, yeah so that's <clears throat> interesting uh, uh, because, again, like, I mean, Seeing that much difference on just a cellular le level is is interesting in terms of innate immune responses and mm -hmm. yeah this and but it, uh, it is setting up the idea that like what is good what is adaptive in bats may have no re like may have have no impact in human cells um, but at the same time that like being more permissive in one situation like we don't know like what is uncovering the the mechanism of spread. Um, or like, you know, the jump, right? That's like the holy grail yeah. in some ways. People would love to know, right? Like, can we identify like a couple loci that if we see it missing, that means it's going to jump, you know, like the next, yeah. the next move is coming into humans. That's, I think that that's really what people want to know from this sort of research in terms of like impact to human health. Um, and so, yeah, but they basically or five doesn't seem to have a big effect um, in the human cells. <clears throat> yeah. But I mean, it is inter the interesting thing about like, because uh, I know when we, when you're looking at HIV, it was quite interesting trying to people were trying to pass about why it wasn't in, like da dangerous to apes, where it was originated compared to what was happening in the humans. Mm -hmm. and so, and so basically understanding the deeper like differences between the immune cells could actually give us ideas about how to better protect our immune cells and how to 
be more like be more bat like in when we're <laughs> fighting coronaviruses absolutely yeah i mean that could be it too i you know that's the thing like there's so many angles to take in data like this Right. Like someone could be taking it from the surveillance angle and say, like, I want to know the step before it jumps. But you could also take it from the therapeutic angle. Right. I want to know the important things that the virus is relying on to cause disease. Right. And then yeah. and then run from there. <clears throat> yeah. Um, should we move on? Are they trying to set up yeah. something else in this? I did. Let's see. Uh, I didn't really see because, I mean, the. Yeah, I think they basically looked at a, a couple of other like proteins as well that were so that, that were stimulated by interferon one. So so basically, if the interferon so GPP one and MX one, they should also show some differences because they're kind of downstream of all the signaling that's, that's going on. So it's mm. just making sure that the interferon is working how we expect it. I imagine. <clears throat> yeah. So interferon being a antiviral cytokine, right? Yeah. Um, a signal and. It's, it's between humans and bats, right? We have this molecule. Um, it might signal differently, but we have this molecule. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, so a lot of the genes that they're testing in figure four, they are interferon-stimulating genes. Yeah. That's correct, right? Um, ISGs, right? <laughs> Is yeah, that's right. <clears throat> so, um, mm -hmm. so, yeah. so, So what we can say, too, because of the difference between the blue bar and the red bar, right, is that removing this um, or five allows the bat like is um, basically allows the bat cells to mount uh, like a greater immune sti uh, interferon stimulated response. Right. The yeah. the virus can't evade this anymore. Um, and I guess that's probably what helps the bat cells survive. <laughs> <Yeah>. Right. <laughs> you got more interferon stimulating genes and that's going to be like, OK, these the virus is being held in check a little bit better. Um, yeah. It doesn't fully eliminate the virus, that the virus is still hopping along fine, um, but the virus can't sort of wipe out huge swaths of the cells anymore. Yeah. <clears throat> I guess in far, as far as both, that's kind of a success. It's a, it's a symbiosis rather than a, so in, from the virus perspective, it's good, and from the immune cell perspective, it's good as well. So yeah. that's, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, this just goes back to like the figure one B or whatever, right? Where we saw the, <laughs> the big oscillations and it kind yeah. of like smooths out over time, right? Like this is the, this is one of their hypothesized mechanisms, right? As to why does that happen, right? We know that at, on a greater level, like evolution should push us towards kind of like some middle ground. And the middle ground here is the battle, well, the battle, <laughs> there's all yeah. these war <laughs> metaphors, whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> the battle between viruses and the interferon stimulated genes, the, that system that's detecting them. <clears throat> yeah, I guess like that's the other thing, like interferon stimulated genes. That's like that's very much a detection package, right? Like you have to be able to see the virus to be able to stimulate the interferon stimulated genes. So it could be that OR5 is some, right? It helps evade that system in some way. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, well, I mean, another thing is that it could even be stimulating of apoptosis because, as you saw, that causes a massive spike in the amount of virus. So uh, it could sure. be like. Yeah, it could so. just be a straight up virulence factor, right? In that sense, like it's yeah. it's causing pathology because it's breaking open the cells so that yeah, you yeah. can get more virus out. <clears throat> I mean, I, I there's just like I mean, I'm going to go into crackpot theory territory here, but the idea of like mutation gated like like vir virulence genes. So mm. like the the idea that like there's a gene there that's specific in a small population that's really good because then it maximizes the amount of virus you get. But then once that gets diluted to a larger population, it selects for a different gene that is better to establish persistence. Yeah, uh, absolutely. <clears throat> so, and, and, and again, like this is what this model is sort of set up to answer. Like they're not answering that question precisely, but yeah. they're building data that could go down that path. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, and also figure five, uh, we've, this go, kind of delves into uh, the uh, things a bit more with, uh, uh, let's see what, the, yeah, so. Yeah, so now they're actually going to take those persistently infected cells <laughs> yes. and they're going to add in back the wild type virus, yeah. right? So, <laughs> so we already have our, we know that like when we have the, when we pass these cells over a long period of time, they get persistently infected. The variant of virus that's infecting them is missing this important immune modulating um, protein. Uh, we can see the effect, right? The cells that are persistently infected make more of this stimulated immune gene. 
So then they say, well, what if we add in that wild type virus? How do those cells behave? Um, I mean, yeah, this is important because there are some viruses that are like defective particles. They get overwhelmed by the wild type if they're present because mm -hmm. they're less good at infecting. So it's kind of important to establish that this isn't just a less good version of the virus. This is a virus that in its own right it has adapted to its own niche specifically here. Yeah, it has its own strategy, right? Like it's not, they want to they, they know, will the wild type virus just like flood this, <laughs> flood this population out a given some time? Um, so what they see is that, uh, well, what did it say? Uh, so the blue line is when they add the wild type in and they're measuring uh, total genomes here. Um, and yeah. they, and then they have the persistent virus with no extra virus. And then they have, uh, the positive control, just the regular cells with that wild type virus. And when they add that, uh, wild type virus and the persistent infected cells, they don't see any increase yeah. in the genome. That's like yeah. really interesting because it, it does <laughs> seem like they're actually preventing the wild type virus from almost just protecting against the, the actual horrible yeah. part of the infection. So. That is very right. interesting. Yeah, like persistently infected. I mean, I, again, when, from what we already know, it's helping. We can already start building that story, thinking like, oh, it's there. All these cells are in a heightened state of immune awareness. Yeah. Right. They're making all those interferon stimulated genes. You flood them with wild type virus. It's the same mechanism that controls them. Right. It's just that like now they're controlled. They're they've already been pre alerted in some ways. Um, but in, in figure B, they, they're looking specifically at that OR5 expression. Yes. And so they do actually see that the OR5 expression goes up when they add the wild type cells. Yeah. R meaning those cells are getting in. <laughs> or sorry, not those cells. The viral particles, the wild type viral particles, they're getting into the persistently infected cells, right? Yeah. They're making some OR5, but that's not enough to shift the balance, right, yeah. of, of allowing the virus to run away with replicating itself um yeah so i guess like that's something about pathogenesis that might have already been known but you know that's something about pathogenesis now like we know or five is important at the early moments of infection right like yeah. once once the cells get <laughs> uh, alerted and they start making that they go into the interferon stimulated response um that's enough to propel further infection um yeah <clears throat> And figure, figure like 5C actually goes into some way to try and explain like uh, why they're less susceptible to the infection by talking about DPP4. And this is the receptor mm -hmm. that coronaviruses, you, that, sorry, the MERS uses to infect cells. Um, and apparently it's uh, downregulated in, in cells that are, in, that are persist persistently infected, making it harder for other coronaviruses, yes. to the, to, for the wild type to infect them. Yes, yeah, so yeah, so that's one thing that they can't get in as well. And then second off is D, is that um, they have, oh, actually, it's actually, you know, it's interesting. So in D, uh, so, uh, when the acute infection comes in. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, yeah, but in persistent infection, it stays, it stays low. <clears throat> yeah, so... That's something. I mean, I want to go back to C because because uh, uh, there is something odd with one oh, of the sorry. cells. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so like. Oh yeah, I forgot. Yeah. So like, because uh, in, in in figure D they show like some. Uh, so I went to the supplementary figure to pick out, and they basically saw picked out some uh, gels that showing the expression of of GPP4, and and through and messing around with like the contrast, I found that that in cells that were persistently infected with. Uh, with uh, the MERS or F5 deletion, there, were, there was some extra bands that the authors didn't really uh, pick up on. And I was just going to throw mm -hmm. it out to see whether... Yeah. Yeah, throw, uh, is the picture up? Yeah, the People picture's see up it? now, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that, that's from the supplement figure, right? It's um, In figure C, they did this RT-PCR to look at the difference in the receptor, um, and they show us like a, a fragment of that image in C. They show us the lower three bands. Yeah. And from that, we see that in the wild type infected cells that weren't persistently infected, they have tons of receptor, right? Is that? Yeah. They, so in wild type, they have tons of that DPP receptor. And in the others, it seems to be really downregulated, um, so, which, is, which is interesting because, I mean, that again backs up the idea that there is less uh, DPP4. Yeah, but but, <laughs> but 
then uh, looking deeper into it, that actually seeing that. So uh, the way the gel bots work is that the smaller you your molecule, the faster it goes through the the gel. So mm -hmm. so apparently some bands are appearing like at, that are a bit bigger that seem to be positive for DPP four that only appear in uh, these cells. So. Um, yeah, so that's super odd. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because that's so. This is like the result of a, a PCR reaction, mm. right? So that reaction is supposed to amplify like a certain band, yeah. right? But obviously, in in the persistently infected cells, something's going on that the same primers that are used uh, in the regular cells is also amplifying a larger band. <laughs> yeah, which which is <clears throat> fascinating, and I mean, it's mm -hmm. kind of suggests that the the virus is like messing around with the actual way the dp4 is manufactured in order to to downregulate it it could be it could be yeah it could be that i mean i um, say that but yeah i mean yeah i mean like i that, that's the thing it's like we don't really know yeah. what that is it certainly is sort of it complicates the matter of interpreting De the data definitely. In interpreting it's, i mean yeah. again it could be <laughs> that or it could be that something odd was happening with the actual reaction something Odd in the, the the apparatus, so I mean, this is why science, this is why yeah. when you see like something in the paper, there are always multiple lines of evidence because there's always a concern that something's gone wrong. And in this case, it could be something, but it could be that so there's some. Because if, if I brought this to my supervisor, they'd immediately say, "Yeah, you, you definitely messed this gel up. Do it again several times, and then figure out what's going on." Um, yeah, sorry, uh, Danny, you've dropped out for a, from the call a little bit, so. Um, uh, hopefully when you, yeah. Yeah, I can, I can hear you very well. Yeah, um, I guess I'm not being expressed. <laughs> uh, yeah. Am I back? Yeah, yeah you're back now. Should you're I back talk? now, yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, like, I, you know, people would usually choose the best pictures, right? Like, when things that are unknown that happen, sometimes it's easier just not to show them. <laughs> that definitely <laughs> but it, but in, in this cases. case, yeah. Yeah, but it, but in this case, I mean, you know, that image in the supplemental, like, w you only were able to see those other bands when you played around with the image settings a little bit, right? Yeah. Like, they're very hard to see. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, this is basically <clears throat> now analyzing each, like, l level of co color band. Um, usually, I do that to spot where someone's, like, been put, doing, doing some, like, copy-pasting or messing around with images, because then you can see scenes that or patterns that get repeated. Ah, uh, yes, so, yes. So, yeah. so you didn't see any scenes. It's not like this is a Frankenstein image. Yeah, no. It's just that these bands are very faint and they were downplayed, right, by the way that the contrast. Yeah, uh, exactly. So it, so through normal contrast settings, you wouldn't be able to spot it. But if you like isolate like very low, uh, uh, the kind of the the various like kind of uh, there's like almost like a curve of of, of black, and if you isolate mm -hmm. each, each individual mm -hmm. like level of black, you can spot different things. But it takes a takes a bit of like tweaking with like the curve settings on on GIMP uh right <laughs> yeah so it could be an artifact of the yeah it could just be nothing right it yeah. could be like an artifact of it but it could also be the beginning of another investigation right like that like at its best it's like oh this data is going into the into the notebook and we're going to figure out what it is later yeah. after we finish the story we're going to follow up and say if we repeat that over and over again, do we see this? Because I think it's so curious that it's in within the first 24 hours, right? It seems yeah. like it's like a time, right? Like it only appears in these two time points, presumably a very important time point where there's lots of wild type virus around. Um, yeah, I think that that's really interesting. <clears throat> yeah, so I mean, this is why it's so great to read papers and so great for open science to talk about them because sometimes you do need other people to look at your data and to see something that you don't. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it would be interesting to me too, like someone who is in this field that sees that, right? Like they could take that information to their lab and they could do the follow-up. Maybe this, maybe these people don't have time to do that follow-up yeah. or no interest, right? It's out there now and someone else could pick up the thread of information. Yeah. And, or, <clears throat> or they might find out that something was odd with their machine and then they'll be able to do better experiments in the future. So, I mean, it, there's, always, absolutely. Yeah, there's always like ups and downs of this, but I mean, the important thing about like, the great thing about critique and doing this all open science is that you get to do some find new things and try to contribute to the scientific process. Anyway, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So, so I I realize that we I I'm taking up a lot of time with that. So uh... <laughs> no, that's cool. Um, 
Yeah, so that's that's the DPP4 expression. It doesn't really change the conclusion that we'll come to, yeah. right, from looking at that figure. We still think that there's less DPP4 expression yeah. in the persistently infected cells, and that could be a mechanism um, as to why you don't see that runaway infection. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think D is strange for the same, for, for another reason. It's like you still get a huge jump in interferon beta in the acute infection, but in the persistent you get less. Um, but if we remember from like uh, four figure four, right? There's this huge amount of effectors that are being made, yeah. <laughs> right? So it's not like interferon, you know. It's that those effectors are being made, but it's not because the interferon response is going off the charts, right? It's some it's something else um, that we're getting those that stimulation. Yeah, this is where things like, get a bit. I mean, it's, even with DP four, if we go back to like from to the uh, figure 4F, where there was no difference, it, yep. and then suddenly there is a difference. That's quite kind of confusing. I, I mean, yeah. What's the time point in F, right? Yeah. That could be something. So I think it might be due to the time point. The time point in F might be just immediately, or I, no, I think this is 48 hours. No, 40 hours post inoculation. I can't remember, but um, F, no significance. For, yes, 48 hours post infection. Yes. So, uh, so yeah, that's. So, but that's between. EFK cells, that's all wild type. They're not actually looking at um, the persistently infected cells here, right? They're just looking at wild type cells infected between the two variants. Right. There's yeah. no difference in the expression. It's, this is like we haven't seen persistently infected cells in this, in this way yet. Right. <clears throat> so that's literally like the cells that haven't been infected yet. And then once you leave the once you pass larger cells, it changes the persistently infected cells, I guess. And that's another right. thing yeah. that c it could be a mutation <clears throat> that's in the persistent persistently infected cells that so could be caused by the virus or it could be an an artifact of the experiment these are they're all sorts of yeah yeah that's interesting i that would not be something that we should be um the method should clear that one up right like what exactly are persistently infected cells in this sense right are they cells that have already been through so many passages and they're using the same cell line or is it like they infect them a couple times with the delta or five, right? And then yeah. they call that persistently infected. I mean, I think they literally just keep growing the persistently infected cells rather than like keeping right. reinfecting them. Yeah, yeah, right. Like this is this is basically the outcome of one B, right? Like yeah. they have a line of cells that they've always passaged with them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it could also be cell driven, right? <laughs> it's hard to say at this at this level. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, which actually makes the story a lot less interesting <laughs> in some ways right because if it is in the cell level they are tumorigenic cells yeah. right so they, they've been fused with the tumor thing so they are getting <clears throat> infection i mean there could be some idea that there is right. some bias caused by the virus being persistently affecting it but, uh -huh, but uh -huh, i mean that would uh -huh. have to require multiple like versions of this experiment repeated so <clears> we can see how it develops in different persistent cells and yeah and within it, yeah and that's not how they did this yeah. that's not yeah that's not the route that they went down here <clears throat> because again they're gonna go down a story of immune immune receptors i yeah. think um okay so let's move then to the last figure where i guess based on the results in d that they see that the interferon response is a little bit different between the acute infection versus the persistent infection um they throw out that hypothesis that it's these important um, immune modulators, IRF3 or MAP kinase mm. signaling, right? That is resulting in the difference. Um, and so they basically repeat, I guess, what we're seeing. But this time they remove the ability of these cells to signal through IRF3, yeah. through siRNA, or um, remove the ability of MAP kinase through a drug in C. Uh, or again, D is also the removing the ability to um, use MAP kinase through a through a another inhibitor UM, URMC99. Yeah. Um, and in both cases, they see that when they remove the ability of these cells to signal through this pathway, um, they see a lot more. MERS. They see a lot more MERS. Yeah, a, yeah. a lot more <laughs> MERS come out, and yeah, that, I mean. <laughs> And that's kind of interesting, I, I guess. I mean, it would be interesting if they figured out whether it behaved the same way, whether the cell it went back to cells apoptosing a lot more, or like mm -hmm. it, like all where it went back to like whether it started looking like how the wild type 
infection looks. So <laughs> seeing if they went through the same. So I mean, sure, yeah. C could they go and recharacterize the panel in four, maybe? Yeah. Right against against these inhibitors and show us a little bit more about that response. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> but they're giving us a mystery, you yeah. know, like where they're. A mystery, but like it's a it's a potential hypothesis, right? Yeah. Because it's driven by their thought of immune modulation that you know there are so many pathways they could have checked, yeah. right? <laughs> and they end up choosing these ones to build their story, maybe because these are the ones that showed some difference. Well, yeah, right. And Matt Kinase yeah. <clears throat> is basically involved with pretty much every pathway as well. Like Matt Kinase <laughs> is like kind of a really central pro protein to like all most signaling pathways. So if you knock that out, mm -hmm. you suddenly get a bunch of effects. So, <clears throat> so I guess like, mm -hmm. ca but casting that means that you you will hit most of the immune response. So I mean, so uh, that's, I mean, it's 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 your go-to protein when you want to see like an, when you want it's when you're looking because because there's like a signaling cascade and you want to go earliest yeah. possible or latest possible to figure out mm -hmm. where the actual uh, virus is right. acting. And I feel like this still doesn't um, rule out the idea that it could be a change in the persistently infected cells, yeah. right? Just like a change somewhere else. Because like these are, again, these are all done in persistently infected cells. They modulated the pathways in those persistent cells. Doesn't mean that the persistent cells didn't already have a pre-modulated pathway, yeah. right? Yeah, from all those, from all that passaging. I wonder, like, would it even be possible, you know, I feel like an experiment there would be they should cure the cell. I don't know if that's possible. If they could cure the persistently infected cells, right, and then repeat the experiment. They, the hypothesis would be that it's different, <laughs> right? That the, if, if, if there's a change in the persistently infected cells, then, then you'd see the same phenotype come out. But if you could somehow remove that virus in the culture, right, yeah. I don't know, through like passaging and um, some sort of like, um, like maybe a budding inhibitor or something yeah. like that, like just like, like slowly that RNA would just be degraded out where you can no longer detect it. Ah, there's always that limit of detection though. Yeah. I don't know. That's a hard one to get to, right? Cause even cause you can't detect it, there could be low levels of that virus still working in there. You can't rule it out. Yeah. Uh. <clears throat> I mean, that, that is a, a key thing that wasn't really like touched on in this paper too much, but I can, but yeah. No, <clears throat> so yeah, I think we covered most things. The last figure is basically showing their, uh, perceived mechanism. They're gonna tie their yeah. They're gonna tie all that information together, yeah. <laughs> and say that um, and it really is based on that principle that viral populations are diverse yeah. to begin with, right? That there's all these different types, um, and their thought is that over time, what you get is that uh, there's this one variant that exists and it's able to establish itself because it doesn't kill the cell. Yeah. <clears throat> um, those, yeah, it doesn't kill the cell. Those cells survive, and because basically uh, that accessory protein can't suppress the immune reaction, um, and so over time you, oh, and and because those cells that have this variant infection resist the infection of the wild type, right? Yeah. Over time, you'll just get more of these cells appearing in the course of an infection. Um, you know that's really based on dose, though, and the, the, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. Uh, the interesting I thought was like, since this was MERS, it was isolated from a human patient. It's almost like they went back and adapted it to viruses again. To, to, sorry, to bats again. So, mm -hmm. so almost like, like there's a two-way immune thing going on evolutionarily here, and I'm. Right. Yeah, because they took yeah they took something that was already in humans, right? They started with a human virus yeah. in this in this sense. Mm -hmm. So almost like <clears throat> getting towards what the ancestral MERS might have looked like or might have behaved like, perhaps. Yeah, a delta mutation though. You know, like yeah. that's I guess that that that's what they found. That's just like what would have occurred. But if we're thinking about ancestral, it wouldn't be delta. No, it, it would be, be like, like a, a a frame <clears throat> shift or like some kind of like minor right, base change right. that would have st stopped it. And they did right, have that, exactly. but I think they decided to use a delta just for the biggest like impact. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, yeah, because at the end of the day, again, like this is an artificial system. Yeah. Right? We're not really saying that this is how it happens in reality, right? Just that this is how this model works, and the principles that we uncover from this could be applied, right, into the into the actual sense. Um, but we don't have the ancestral strain, right? Yeah. <laughs> and we can't, and we don't know like how it passaged in which bats precisely. <laughs> um, yeah.
yeah. but but uh, like really interesting i mean like i think what what i got out from this paper is that you know just like diving into the biology of mers yeah. right and thinking about like oh like all these accessory proteins you know like you get fixated on like the big things that people are talking about yeah. right like spike protein mm -hmm. immunization all this stuff but there's like the but the actual pathogenesis of these viruses is, is actually quite complex yeah like there's a lot of stuff going on there's a lot of ways the immune system is being tickled and and the events that are occurring to the virus before it gets into humans um that's setting the stage right for its ultimate like pathogenesis round in humans mm -hmm. and, yeah, it's, it's quite good to get into a proper microbiology paper like that looks into the biology of the of the virus rather than, because with vaccine papers mm -hmm. after a while they all kind of merge together once you read them because they all do the same sorts of things <laughs> So. yes 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 yeah you're very focused just on like making that product but here like yeah there's a real <clears throat> sort of investigation going on a question and a story that's emerging um and of course the counter narratives from us reading it like we can build counter narratives yeah. uh, seeing the data so, i mean that's a really good good exercise as well and and i did do did enjoy like kind of p peeling apart this paper and finding out weird things that i wouldn't have found out if i was just passively reading it and <laughs> I, yeah I, yeah i really appreciate like having the opportunity to talk about this and because this wouldn't be the kind of paper mm -hmm. i'd select on my own uh, i'm quite, quite glad because <laughs> i usually because at the moment i'm focused on when are we going to get out when are we going to be able to go outside where's the vaccine but yeah yeah i'm, I'm glad yeah. you suggested this one this was a uh, quite a, a good one yeah well we hope the, for people who follow along they also enjoyed the discussion um again if you have paper suggestions please tweet us out yep. uh using that hashtag below now oh, yeah the, the hashtag <laughs> or in is the description there. uh mike <laughs> we've got our twitter handles underneath the, us so you can oh yeah suggest that directly um mm -hmm. and you can follow at micro dear micro t wjc as well uh to message us and yep. next week we'll be just doing some general discussion and selecting the next paper and hopefully if I get, I might get a message back from the researchers about this paper, so I can maybe discuss that if they get back to me, which would be really good. Oh, uh, yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, and we can just <clears throat> keep keep up the discussion. It'll be more general, more conversational, and it'll be quite, it, yeah. So <laughs> that we aren't conversational right now. <laughs> yeah, no, we're being very official and professional. We are scientists <laughs> <laughs> talking about Dracula and Batman and yeah, all scientific. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so we're happy to that you could join us and um see you next week yeah <clears throat> see you next week bye <laughs>